So joining us uh, Media Mouse is Suzanne Arms. Uh, she's a writer, journalist, author of numerous books, uh, um, an educator, and an advocate for you know natural birthing and the, and the well-being of women. So thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Uh, you know, I watched your your documentary this morning, and one thing that kept coming up in my in my head when I was watching this is um, what. What motivated you personally, or what things happened in your life in the late 60s, early 70s, when you decided to make this a, your life? Right. Well, you know, some people cast around for years trying to figure out what their passion is. I really had a hole blown in me that catapulted me into this work. I was a nursery school teacher and a daycare teacher, and my passion was making the world safe for children. And... Uh, when I gave birth, it was 1970, and I was already 27 years old. And I had no idea um, what was going on in birth, and I had no idea how much fear I carried from the birth that I had, in other words, from being born. So I, I gave birth in a hospital that was supposed to be the natural childbirth hospital with the natural childbirth doctors in San Francisco, and had anything but a natural childbirth. And, um, and that experience left me with tremendous uh, sadness and, over a period of time, a great deal of anger uh, at what happens to women in birth. Now, it was a long time before I looked at the issue of what happens to babies in birth. So it's funny that I started out with a passion to make the world different for children, then got deeply involved in it as a woman's issue, and then, much later, looking at it as a baby issue, and then as today, a mother-baby issue, because uh, it is. But uh, it's over a period of decades that I have evolved to understand the issue as, as deep as it is. And I know these are like really long conversations have about any of the yeah, right. of components of it, but what, what are the, what, are, what, do you, what do you say are the main things that have contributed to us as human beings being so detached from what seems to be one of the most, if not the most fundamental uh, part of our existence is, is birthing, the birthing right. process. Birthing what, and dying, what right. Kind of things have, what kind of things have con really contributed so uh, that people really like, like your personal experience, you had really no idea right. like what. Well, first of all, the Industrial Revolution had a, a lot to do with it. Uh, we, we got into the post-Industrial Revolution with an excitement that machines were going to make life easy. And what happened is human beings ended up adapting to machines and becoming more machine-like in order to work with machines. and. Uh, and so birth, like everything else in medicine, became compartmentalized. It became seen as an isolated event um, instead of a series of interlocking, sophisticated processes that, uh, by and large, work if you don't mess with them, especially if a woman comes to birth in a state of good health. We began to see the process itself as faulty and something that could be improved upon. So I would say it has a great deal to do with industrialization, has a great deal to do with our passionate love of technology, and uh, with patriarchy, which is a whole other subject. Sure, certainly. Yes. Because when I gave birth, all obstetricians were men. Now today, most obstetricians going through training are women, but they're still being trained in the same system, and it is a patriarchal system. And so you'll find a woman behaving the same way as a man in what she tells you. In fact, some of the best people doing birth are older men whose ego is not so attached to being right and needing to control and are willing to step back and allow a woman to do what she does. Isn't that ironic? Mm. Rather than a young feminist obstetrician. Mm. Could you say a little bit more about how that's... how that? the system of patriarchy manifests itself within within that sort of medical establishment. I mean, you gave a, you gave a little bit of an example there, but I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit more about you know, ways in which that continues right. to sort of um, dictate how things... Well, one of the things that happens when women are in labor is that they drop into a state of deep vulnerability and compliancy, and uh, their dependency needs are very high. It makes a woman very childlike. And if someone comes from a background of control and management, 
it's going to trigger in many people the feeling that I need to dominate the situation, I need to control it, I need to fix this little girl. Now when I gave birth, they, they, we even had uh, practices that actually turned women into little girls, shaving all of their pubic hair, for example, completely desexualizing them. And birth is a sexual experience, so when you turn it into an event to be controlled and managed, you alter the biochemistry, you alter, you alter everything. And people who haven't had really great births, who don't understand what it is, misinterpret women's cries for help as a cry for drugs. Or they'd cry for drugs as a cry to be put out of their misery, but what it really is is to have someone say to them, you're beautiful, you're doing well, this is working you and the baby are doing just fine and you can do this. We have, we have come to believe that there is no value in the process itself and that's part of uh, the Industrial Revolution too. Uh, it's, we are concerned with products, we're not concerned with process. We don't think process matters. And, and, and watching your, your documentary, I mean, if, if one has never witnessed a, a birth, uh, that obviously is a hugely transformative experience in and of itself. If you're seeing a real birth, if you're seeing a real not birth. if you're seeing a woman lying on her back and being done to and the baby pulling, being pulled out or cut out. <clears throat> if you're seeing a woman giving birth with her own force, her own power, which is really the baby in she, because mm -hmm. the baby guides itself in labor, you're seeing a, something totally different. Well, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, what you said to me what you called the, the hallmarks of, of birth. I mean, I, the hall, hallmarks of birth in this yeah, society. Yeah. Well, the hallmarks of modern birth are, are very interesting because you can't really separate a way of birth from a society's value system. They go hand in hand. And we, we value competition. And we value people not forming deep relationships and being able to move from one job to another, from place to place, without forming deep attachments. So we have a form of birth that uh, creates that very nicely. Its, it's hallmarks are isolation and uh, drugs, a high level of stimulation, of stress, and maternal separation which in many cases amounts to real maternal deprivation. So you've got a woman being under high stress in pregnancy, working to the end of pregnancy, no paid maternity leave. Some of these are big structural issues. No guaranteed paid maternity leave. The only so-called developed nation in the world other than South Africa that, uh, that doesn't. And, uh, and then they have these interventive births and they have induced labors and drugs and babies pulled out, babies cut out. Then the baby is separated from the mother and the mother may or may not breastfeed because we consider breastfeeding a lifestyle choice instead of what it is, which is a biological necessity to the development of the baby and to the mother-baby bond. And the mother goes back to work and the baby sleeps in a separate room and then we start even more stimulation with the baby in front of television and the baby sitting on the adult lap while the adult is doing computers and then we go to computer games and we wonder why our kids are fried by the age of two and three and why they're off the wall in, in nursery school. So it's, uh, it's really hyper stimulation and isolation, deprivation, maternal deprivation and uh, it breeds a highly competitive ambitious, aggressive society, and a violent one, with a lot of loneliness thrown in. Mm -hmm. So we now have children on antidepressants, and we have women being given uh, antidepressants in pregnancy, prophylactically, in other words, to so-called prevent depression. And uh, that's another subject altogether because postpartum depression is really just a subset of female depression, which is women stuffing their rage at how they are treated in, a, in this particular society, in modern society. And we're exporting it around the world rapidly. So when we talk about a 35% cesarean rate in this country this year, you know, we had a 35% cesarean rate in Greece 10 years ago. We got a 30% cesarean rate in Bali. 
we got a 30% cesarean rate in socialized medicine countries, which is really interesting when you think about it, because they're not paying doctors to do to do cesarean births, paying them more. In this country, most doctors get paid more for a cesarean, and hospitals reap lots of extra money from interventions. So the system is built on interventions, and we just don't make the connection between the kind of birth we have and the kind of society that we've created. In hearing you say that, that doctors get paid more to, to do cesareans here in yeah. this country, so in addition to this being within a sort of a patriarchal framework, um, uh, it's also within a for-profit framework. Oh, it's, it's a also highly part of the problem with. It, 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 there's a lot of money to be made in birth. It is an industry. It's an unregulated industry, largely unregulated. About 150 billion dollars a year that could be going to feeding people, and to a social support system, and a safety net, and uh, going to the root of some of the problems in this society. And instead, we're pouring it into birth, and. Uh, it's, it's costly. It's costly for a woman to have a cesarean. It takes a number of uh, people pulled off of working with women in labor to do a cesarean. Three, four, five people on staff. When I saw that in Ethiopia, I was just so sad, you know, because they picked up the worst of our system, isolating women from their family members in, in labor, nothing to eat, which is, makes it almost impossible for the uterus to work well, putting the woman on her back in labor and then covering everybody in the room, her and the entire staff, in gowns and masks and caps and booties, which in the public hospital in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia meant hand washing all of that stuff, mm. all of it being unnecessary. And then I watched a cesarean. and. Uh, it was, it was just, it's tragic because those are resources they need to feed people. But people don't understand it's a major economic industry as well. When an anesthesiologist inserts an epidural, usually the anesthesiologist gets paid for the insertion and for every hour it is in place. So at an unconscious level, if not at a conscious level, this person is going to want to get that epidural in place as early as possible. And thus, anesthesiologists come and visit women in labor when they first arrive at the hospital. Are you ready for your epidural? Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like putting the drug, the drug dealer in charge of the children in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. but that's what we have. Mm -hmm. and, and nobody talks about it because we are working on faulty assumptions that children aren't affected by drugs that they have no memory of trauma in birth, and that none of this matters. Well, maybe to continue with that idea that folks aren't talking about these issues, I mean, we're, we're a week and a half away from elections. I mean, wh why is this issue not even on the radar screen, period? I mean, healthcare alone is sort of even on kind of fringely on a right. way in the way they talk about it. Right. It's, it's only within kind of with a, a, a different variations of a managed Right. for-profit healthcare system. Right. I mean, we, what, 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 what could you say to people who are, and again, thinking about their, their role in, in that kind of process of elections about this issue? Well, the, f the first thing is that it's been a very sophisticated effort ever since Reagan to market conservatism. And I don't mean conservatism in the true sense of the word, which is to, to treat resources in a conservative way and to protect them and to maintain them. But I mean a reactionary politics to, to get poor people, working class people to believe that if they vote with the rich, they might become rich. It's, it's the greed principle. Now the greed principle doesn't work when people's needs are met as children and they're healthy and they're feeling fulfilled, which has a great deal to do with how the mother bond has been from conception to age one as their brain and nervous system are, are forming. Have they had their needs met? But greed is something that works very well with a population of you know, hyperstimulation and maternal deprivation and using objects to satisfy our needs instead of human relationships. So. Why this hasn't come about in the political campaign is that there's been a concerted effort to make sure it stays off the issues. If Barack talks about it, he, it's like if he talks about how bad the economy is. 
he's the bad guy who's telling us things we don't want to hear because we already feel bad. Oh, you know, I didn't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling bad today. So he has, to, he has to keep away from that. And the politicians are supposed to keep away from that and make the public feel good. And, uh, and the person who blows the whistle, you know, who announces that there's something going on in the middle of the room that nobody wants to talk about, mm -hmm. the elephant in the room, uh, is, is labeled. Mm -hmm. And it makes it very, very difficult. It's, it's, there's so much of what we happen, have happened in so much of modern life with regard to relationships is dysfunctional, but it's named normal. Mm -hmm. And in birth, we see a perfect example. We normalize what is abnormal, which is major surgery for birth, which is introducing major drugs into a baby's body that has no ability to process artificial chemicals. No ability. Its liver can't tolerate it. it. These drugs leave the baby after many more days than they leave the mother's body. And they alter the biochemistry of the mother-baby bond. They alter the biochemistry of the mother's brain so that the falling in love doesn't occur because she's had dr artificial drugs, right? Well, we don't know anything about this because our society is built on artificial stimulation and numbing ourselves out and uh, using various sorts of, of drugs and um, toys to keep us from feeling. And so if you have a society of healthy people, they don't fall for this kind of politics. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm interested in this issue and not working at the other end, is I feel this is where we can change the kind of human being so that we have fully th feeling, thinking, centered, connected, human beings, mind, body, emotions, spirit, who, who make decisions out of a deep core knowing. They're much less likely to be dependent on other people and, and going around asking for other people to tell them what to do. I, I hope that gives you a bit of a picture because we are creating the human beings who destroy the world. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we do with the kinds of stress we put women under and the ignorance among the medical profession as well as the general population. This won't hurt you. You know, it's like the old, this hurts me more than it hurts you, right. abusing right. kids. Right. And then the kids grow up to abuse their kids saying, you know, my father beat me and I deserved it. Yeah. <laughs> and because it's been said long enough, people believe it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, having a physician tell a woman who's already in a very porous state, a very open, tender, vulnerable state, having him pat her or her pat her on the, the knee and say, now, you know, I can guarantee that this drug won't get to your baby. Mm. You believe it. Yeah. Go straight to the baby. Yeah. But that's, and your gut knows it or you wouldn't have asked the question in the first place, which is what women say, is this going to hurt my baby? Mm -hmm. But when you have the authority figure that you believe in more than yourself because you've been socialized to be terrified of this process, then you want to believe it. But yeah. I just don't want to blame women for sure, it. Sure, sure. Um, the victims. Mm -hmm. all, the doctors are victims. Mm -hmm. The victims of a system right. that isn't working. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that when people like you identify the elephant in the room, when you talk about these things that, that the system discourages against, that, that people's reactions are, are, are what? I mean, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I can remember uh, going down, uh, up an elevator in a Hyatt hotel where there was a conference happening in the early 80s, and this was when the early research on electronic fetal monitoring which is done routinely across the country in every labor, was shown to be worthless. Worse than worthless, because the one life that it might save out of every 10,000, it put many more lives at risk because of the interventions, such as cesarean, that people did as a result of the monitor tracing. And I saw the man who did the study, his name is Haverkamp, coming down the elevator, and I said, I just, I." I think we're going this way. And I said, I just want to thank you, Dr. Haverkamp, for your work. And he looked at me and he said, you, you have just destroyed women's trust in doctors. 
and went on down the escalator. Wow. And, and I, I remember when periodically I'd be invited to speak at a, a, a local, regional, you know, let's say a local group of OBGYNs. And, uh, and I had people scream at me from the audience you know, it's all well and good to talk about what women want and, you know, women's feelings in labor. But who cares about the baby? You know, and I, I just wanted to say, who's there in the middle of the night when this woman has been walking with this screaming baby for two nights in a row and her partner has to go back to work and she's ready to throw this kid against the wall? You tell me who cares about the baby. Because, of course, you're not there. Right. You know, but that's the way the issue is framed. And so natural childbirth is framed as um, something for martyrs, something for women who are, you know, masochistic and like pain. And it's not framed as babies need normal, biologically normal vaginal birth. Women need it and their bond needs it because the kind of birth a woman has affects how responsive she is to that baby, how quickly she picks that baby up when it cries, and how she mothers that baby. And that is what determines whether the baby feels the world is a safe place. So when I look around the world and I look at how people are voting, you know, I take guesses at what their births were like mm -hmm. and what their mothering was like from George Bush on down. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe by way of, um, you know, bringing this full circle to some degree, you, you, you're, you're in Grand Rapids, you're speaking tonight to, to, to folks who are going to come here you talk about this topic, and you, you mentioned uh, at dinner last night that, that maybe you might address the, the issue of getting us to move from a coping society to, to a, a thriving, a thriving society. society. Could, could right. you speak a little bit about what you mean when you say that? Okay, I, I will. Um, before I do that, I want okay. to say one thing, because as I'm picturing an audience, I'm picturing somebody working in politics or in a political realm or somebody working in social services, let's say with battered women, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at this pregnant woman holding her belly, mm -hmm. and I'm not wanting to frighten her by what I say. I'm wanting to make sure she feels really safe and comfortable, and at the same time, I'm wanting to let people know what the situation is and how seriously bad it is. Mm -hmm. and that's a big challenge for me. Yeah. It's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to talk a lot more to audiences of people working in the area of ecology and ecological solutions and climate change, political change, social economic change, injustice and racism, because I know of the connections. For example, women who suffer racism have a much higher level of prematurity and low birth weight and a much higher level of stillborn babies. We know that. That research has been done. So let's, let's get to coping and thriving. We've, you know, I've begun to talk about uh, to people that I, I want to see us move from a coping society to a thriving society. A coping society is a society built on anxiety, fear, loneliness, isolation, and uh, an ancient brain that is hyperstimulated, and a midbrain that is anxious, and a neocortex that is dominant and working out of fear. So what you have, what you're supposed to have biologically is a very stable ancient brain like this. And that brain is a touch brain, it's the brain that's formed by singing, by women having low stress in pregnancy, by having natural birth, by wearing the baby skin to skin, by sleeping within three feet of the baby, which regulates the breath and means that the baby doesn't have to cry to get to be fed and doesn't have to scream to wake somebody up down the hall. This is what it looks like, this, the stable brain structure with a very calm ancient brain. And sitting on the top of it is the prefrontal lobes of the neocortex, which is elegant discernment and decision making. But they're in the service of the human heart because the ancient brain is stable. What we have in this society is this. We have a very unstable ancient brain. And it starts in the womb with women under stress. And those hormones go straight to the baby, her thoughts 
her emotions, go straight to the baby. Philosophers, artists, mystics were right all those years when they said that a woman shapes her baby. It's true, but society shapes the woman. So you can't take the woman alone. You've got to give her a system of nurturing and protection in order to have a, a happy pregnancy. And when, when you do, you have people making decisions out of a sense of trust and love. Not hypervigilance, not anxiety, not the sense of I got mine, sorry if you can't get yours, which is the basis of this uh, right-wing so-called conservatism, which I don't call conservatism, it's reactionary politics. And you see people as one, you see you see each other as the same, and you automatically want to give and help. It comes from a natural feeling that there is enough. So when, when we are talking about moving from coping to thriving, we're, we're really talking about how we hardwire the baby's brain and about the mother-baby bond when they are one biological unit, which is that baby is experiencing whatever the mother experiences. And we should be looking at how are we treating women? How are we treating them? The, the key is a midwife for every mother. I mean, that's probably the biggest change we could make right now, is to start training midwives in community colleges as well as in universities and trade schools, continue to trade the, through apprenticeship as well as training nurse midwives. As many midwives as we can get out and turn the table from 32,000 practicing obstetricians and about 8,000 midwives to 70,000 midwives and 20,000 obstetricians. We just don't need many obstetricians. And the ones we, we need are those who will be in the service of the birth, in the service of the midwife, in the service of the woman. They're not into control and management. They're skilled technicians, like our car needs a skilled technician is not to disrespect it. It's very important. We need a car that runs and runs well or we die. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, the wheel falls off, the brake job wasn't done right. Well, it's the mm -hmm. same thing when we need an obstetrician. But to go to an obstetrician for a normal birth is insane. In you know, in, if you look at a country like Holland that has worked very hard to keep birth normal, they put the midwives in charge of the system. And the midwives refer to a physician, and they choose which physician to refer to. And if they don't like the way that physician practices, then they don't refer. But how many times does, does a woman go to an obstetrician, and he, she or he says, you don't need me, let me give you the names of five midwives. So that's number one, is that we, we need a midwife-based system of care. Mm -hmm. And we, we need as many doulas as we can in hospitals so that we have one-on-one -on -one support for women. And we need people teaching birth classes who are independent of hospitals. See, way back in the 70s, the hospitals decided there was money to be made for uh, teaching their own birth classes because this revolution occurred in the early 70s where Bradley classes, Lamaze classes, and others started uh, telling women about birth, why birth is important, why breastfeeding is important, why it's important not to circumcise a baby boy. It's a whole other subject. Um, but again, to not traumatize babies. Mm -hmm. And uh, hospitals decided there was money to be made, and they went after it. So the idea of going to the hospital to get your free birth classes, well, what do you think you're going to be taught? And usually, in most cases, although in some cities this doesn't happen, across the country in most cases, an anesthesiologist comes and visits the birth class. Again, it's like the drug pusher it, coming into kindergarten to talk to the kids about the candies, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. So in a thriving society, we would have the mother-baby bond respected and protected. And that means we would have paternity or uh, parental leave paid as well as maternity leave paid. And we would have a, a, a system that rewarded businesses with tax incentives and all kinds of things for, for doing this. Mm -hmm. And uh, there would be no ICU without a mother-baby bed. The idea of separating a baby from a mother who's very vulnerable and small would be insane, right? It is insane. We wouldn't have infant daycare. 
when I was in San Francisco in the daycare system, you could not, in 1965, you could not put a child in public daycare under the age of two and a half. Mm. Today, you can put a child in full-time daycare at 10 weeks of age. Mm. So that really says it all. And we've normalized that. Mm. That now becomes the norm. And feminism has taken the path of focusing on more daycare yeah. and getting women back to work where the real issue is making sure that our children during these high dependency need times from conception to age one get their needs met then we meet our needs by meeting their needs a well-bonded mother doesn't want to leave her baby and a well-bonded father doesn't want to either but if you can get kids separated from their parents early enough then you end up with a society of coping and people take the drugs they they take in order to survive whether it's cigarettes or alcohol, or antidepressants, or anti-anxiety drugs. Mm -hmm. So in a thriving society, you see cooperation, and you see people make wise decisions, and they're not based on fear. I hope that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. That's great. Um, we certainly encourage people to, to go to the website, the Birds in the Future Birding website. the Future is the nonprofit that we started mm -hmm. to get this information out. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I do want to add one last thing, that in a tribal society that is high functioning, the entire tribe or unit acts as the matrix or the mother. It is not just a single biological person. It's as we have made smaller and smaller families and more and more fragmented families that the biological mother or the person who is mothering, which might be an adoptive mother or foster mother, becomes more and more significant. So, you know, uh, when we look at restructuring society, we're also looking at neighborhoods and communities and people living in ways that they don't feel isolated and they don't want to live alone. It's not normal for human beings to want to be as isolated as many people want to be. Well, Suzanne, Arm, thank you so much. Thank you for having the, me. The and conversation's it's been very <laughs> nurturing. So. It's been birth it's birthingthefuture.org is the organization. and. Uh, I hope people will consider that birth is a political issue. It's an economic issue. It's an ecological issue. And mm -hmm. as we change birth, we will see different human beings make better decisions about the world. Great. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>